Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to session three of what is the fifth annual Digital Leader Conference sponsored by Digit, organized by Digit. Now, I've been married a long time. I have two adult grown-up daughters. Um, I believe that when I speak at home, people listen to what I say, pay attention to what I say. That makes me delusional. It's not just individuals that can be delusional. Organizations can be delusional too. So in this section, we're going to look at how you go about getting rid of some of those delusions, how you improve business alignment, um, and how you improve outcomes. What we're going to do is have three speakers back to back. And at the end of that, there will be a chance to ask questions of any of the three. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a facility there for typing in questions, and I will process the questions to them as they come in. So you can do that at any time. Our first speaker is Aubrey Stern, uh, Chief Technical Officer and Technology Commentator, who basically wants to talk around the subject of risk and compliance challenges. So Aubrey, over to you. Fantastic. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see the, the slides. This is a new platform for me, so I'm not um, totally familiar with it. But we are going to talk about risk and compliance. We're going to talk about the impact of compliance and the way that we build software, how regulated software or how regulated industries have tried to do that, um, and the need for a chain of evidence, because ultimately all software in the future is going to be regulated. Um, so I tried to theme this a little bit around around Scotland, and I, I know that Scotland is a, an inventor of many things: the bicycle, the steam engine, penicillin, insulin, and my personal favourite, the battered Mars bar. Um, I'm hoping that the audience is laughing at that. Um, and something called the chain home, which is um, the first military installation of a radar system that was used to protect the UK. Um, and this was invented by Sir Robert Alexander Watt Watson. And um, I'm going to use that as the sort of like beginning and it's going to become the end. So let's remember chain home. Let's skip to this next one. Now, this is us. We, we are here. And, and while I do this talk, it's going to take us, we, we want to go roughly just, just to the side a little bit. So it seems pretty close it, it notionally. But in order to, to sort of make my point, I have to go really far out. And then you're going to sort of realize, I hope by the end, where the industry is and where these regulated industries are and where we are in software development when it comes to regulation and compliance. Now, as a good product engineer, I need to understand my customers. And as a CTO, I need to do that too. Um, and that means more than just the customer that I'm delivering software to, that can mean the internal customers too. So I look at my stakeholder, look at the people that are involved in this. And in regulated environments, my stakeholders are often um, covered by regulation and so those folks are subject to it so i need to understand the regulation that they are subject to in order to do my job properly and for my engineers to do their job properly and a lot of this talk is around how we're not great at that and how we don't really have those lines of defense in place so if we look at this diagram this is how how we like to work like engineers like to ship software and that's our motivation and it's a lot like game theory. So we get that quick win, that quick buzz in our mind. A little bit of dopamine gets released when we ship something. We feel really good about ourselves. And then at the end, we're, we're seeking that customer feedback. So all that customer feedback is coming back and, oh, OK, I'm going to iterate my products and ship something out really great to the customer. And that's a cycle that, that I want to be in. And in these regulated environments, um, it can be quite difficult to achieve that. And quite often, and we can debate whether security or testing comes first or which way around they go or where they should be. I love to see testing baked into development and then be no actual testing function at all. But that aside, what we often end up in these with these regulated environments is something like this, where, where you sort of get to the end and, and there's a notion of putting something live and then there's another classification, putting something live with actual users using it. And then there's another classification of putting something live with actual using uh, actual users using it uh, at volume. And so each one of those denotes like a new level of risk for the organization. And, and lots of them have these sort of micro um, toll gates or checkpoints that you have to get through. Uh, and you're going to do that by engaging with the risk organization in the business. So you get to this, this piece here. Where, yeah, it's big, unknown if you're not initiated to it. Um, and I'm going to take this moment because this slide is quite 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 long in an animation. I thought, God, what am I going to put here? I thought, let me explain to you the notion of uh, risks to controls to governance, uh, sorry, to guardrails. So if we start with the risk of leaking customer data, um, which means we might get fined by the ICO, we might lose 4% of our turnover per year, we will suffer reputational damage um, and, and potentially material risk. So 
we would establish control that says, um, and it's a lot, a lot of directives like the EU, so, so very woolly, that we should encrypt all customer data at rest and we should encrypt all customer data in transit. And we might establish a guardrail that looks like that by using something called Terraform and we'll say, okay, if we're going to build a database on AWS, that it's going to be encrypted by default. And then we might create uh, a rule on something like AWS config that says alert on any database being encrypted that are um, being created that aren't encrypted by default. And so what we've got is a, a sort of detect um, and, and warn system there in that, in that guardrail. So we've met the control, um, but and ultimately that should protect us from that risk occurring. And so that's sort of the, the sort of chain that we're looking to build. We're looking to look at the risks, establish control, and then implement the guardrails that keep us inside that control that should protect us from the risk. And so this is the risk organization, Hello Risk, and we start engaging with these folks. Um, and I'm going to go over the three lines of risk defense. And this is something that was created by the Institute of Internal Auditors. It's been revised relatively recently, I think last year in August, um, and it's now affectionately known as the three lines model. Um, you might hear this called the four lines of risk defense. Um, now, the first line of risk defense own the risk because they own the outcome. Um, and overall, they own the management and the, um, they measure the effectiveness of controls. Um, recently in the new revision, um, they have become the principal source of non-independent assurance to the board. The second line is more of a support function, so risk control, risk oversight, um, and they need to identify, assess, manage, and control these risks. Um, we're expecting in all these facets, you know, financial control, security, risk, inspection, like there are more, um, to have deep knowledge of these subjects and to be able to, to engage in a healthy way um, often they're going to report to, to, the, to the board or, or, or sorry, they're going to report to, to management. And so you they go directly to the management in this model. Um, and they're going to give us that sort of healthy challenge. Um, now, third line um, should never have direct responsibility for owning risk. Um, that, that audit capability is kept very separate from the first two so they can have that independence and be distinct. Um, they assess the effectiveness of controls and they report directly to the board. So they have that separate report chain so it skips the internal management level and it goes directly to the board or your governance committee or, or have you set your organization up um, and your audits generally are performed against um, risks and not controls um, and then so finally you know when you look at the, the the next line you've got external audit and regulator and that's really like what we would affectionately know as the fourth line of defense so when you go to your big four and external auditor that's really your fourth line and as we move through these lines we move away from our understanding of the business. It gets less of so the product that we're building. We're, we're moving further away from that. And you can sort of see that as you get to external, their knowledge of the business has decreased um, massively. Um, whereas you might find interesting trade-offs where, you know, third line don't have technology capability, but fourth line do have that technology capability. And so, you know, almost always you're looking at a fourth line assurance review for a technology implementation. Now, um, this essentially exists to, to ask the question, does it make sense to have somebody outside the risk-taking decision-making process to provide robust and independent challenge. And, it, and it's an extension of the full rights principle and or, or the two-person two inter, internal control mechanism. And, and that's why we have it, to create those lines of protection, that independent oversight and those abilities to, to protect ourselves from these risks that emerge. Now, we're going to use banking as the principal example for this. So um, the Capital Requirements Directive was something that was established by the um, European Banking Association. Um, and that came from Basel. And I'm going to read this slide and sort of explain what it all means. So CRD was established by a, super, uh, a supervisory framework um, in the EU that reflects the Basel rules on capital measurement and capital standards. It's important to know this because in an SMCR firm, you're going to have SMFs, up to 17 of them. The PRA SMFs are subject to the remuneration rules. The FCA SMFs are only subject to them if they're MRTs, either quantitatively or qualitatively. Uh, remuneration rules are enforced by the FCA and PRA, and, and if you fall into them, you're known as a coded employee or a remuneration code employee. Um, this means being paid a percentage of a remuneration in either retained instruments or with an appropriate vesting period that's deferred over n number of years. These are also subject to malice and clawback. So what that means is if you're an MRT, you will be paid over a certain number of years. So you might get 50% of your bonus, and it will paid over the next three years. Um, and that gives this firm ample opportunity to perform either malice or clawback. So they can adjust that if your risk taking has been 
too much and you've impacted the firm in some sort of material way. And they can do that after those are vested with you as well. So they can come back after and, and have another bite of the cherry and say, we want some money back. So th there's a sort of balance there. Now, the senior management and certification regime in the UK was part of the regulator's drive to improve culture, governance and accountability within financial services firms. It aims to deter misconduct by improving individual accountability and awareness um, of conduct issues across firms. And, th and this is a really deep subject, so I'm trying to cram a lot into 20 minutes. It may be worth reading up outside this talk. The Capital Requirements Directive for financial services industry have introduced supervisory frameworks in the European Union, which reflect Basel II and Basel III rules on capital measurements and capital standards. So this is something that was pushed down after Basel um, and we essentially a directive was created, the CRR and the CRD uh, inside the, the EU. And then that was pushed down into local regulators such as the FCE and the PRA in the UK. And the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision is a committee of uh, banking supervisory authorities that were established by the Central Bank of Governors, the group of 10 countries in 1974. The committee expanded its membership again in 2009 and then again in 2014. So at the highest levels, what we're looking at is global regulation around banking that then gets trickled down into those sort of um, regional areas and then into the local country. So every level, there's a sort of trickle down of where this is happening. But the important point is that a lot of this is happening at global level now. So, it's, so we're looking at global familiarity with, with regulation. And then finally, this concept of material risk taker. So a material risk taker is a designation that um, essentially you're able to, alt to affect the material position um, of the firm. You can cause great harm. If you're in an area where you have oversight, where the people that are working for you can cause great harm or you can cause great harm, you're in a position of material risk. And, and this is why... Um, there are rules on how to identify material risk takers. Sometimes it's quantitative, sometimes it's qualitative, sometimes you just happen to be somebody that's in part of a significant harm function, but you'll be identified as material risk taker. And it, sometimes that comes with uh, rewards. So this is where we are. And we're sort of halfway through um, and we're running over time. And it feels like we've gone really quite far out from software engineering. And, and there is a reason for that. Um, and we'll get to it quite quickly. So if you're a material risk taker, that there are some negatives to this. You could end up in galactic prison. So if something goes horribly wrong and you've broken some serious rules or someone has broken serious rules and the buck is designed to stop with you, you could be the person that ultimately goes to prison. And we've seen regulators and, 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 and countries chase after people, such as in the case of like buy a card and, and things like that. On the other hand, you could get paid galactic riches. So you're being incentivized to act as a risk counterweight. So if you want to get your bonus, which can be deferred over many years, so every single year you get a bonus, and every year 50% of that might be deferred over up to eight years, and that keeps happening every single year, you're very incentivized to continue to be in a good standing with the firm and good standing with the regulator and get that bonus. So you provide the risk counterweight sort of um, uh, measure so that, that people aren't taking too much risk and you're not putting the firm in harm's way. And that's, that's the point. So that's, that's where you are. Now, if you're one of these people, you might have a ton of other people working underneath you. So if you look at like your typical sort of initiatives, business initiatives, which each one maybe has a project underneath, and then each one of those maybe has like a couple of hundred people, you can be talking about thousands of people working for you, working and building these products and who are subject to legislation and standards that are regulated. Now, that presents a ton of danger to us. What, what do we do with all of that danger? What are we, we going to do to protect ourselves? Well, we look back to those three lines of risk defense, and we look to our first line of risk defense, which is run by our management, and we're looking to provide a measure of internal controls. We're looking to, to make sure that we're mitigating those risks. We've got that sort of um, uh, collaboration with second line, so second line of providing that support function, bringing in that deep insight to look at things like security and to make sure that we're in good standing. Um, and then we have our other lines of defense. So... When you read something like this, this formula, and I put the underpants gnome on here because I thought it looks a little like the South Park underpants gnome formula, but you have the inherent risk minus the impact of existing controls, and that gives you your current residual risk position. Now, if you take that residual risk position, you divide it by the cost of new controls, that gives you the risk leverage. Now, it's an interesting sum because this is the sum that the business is doing to work out whether it's worth their time to go and implement new controls. That may not be in your best interest as a material risk taker. 
that is the firm working out whether they're going to go and apply those controls or not but it might not save you it might not always be in your best interest as a material risk taker you might say yes i want all the controls in the world because i want to protect myself from something going wrong and i can distill this into a more uh, sensational slide um and I, and I watched a movie recently the devil has a name and i thought that's a great way to put it because it reminds me exactly of the situation and they say it like this it's called net present value and as long as you make more profit doing the bad than the net loss incurred if you're caught, there's no reason to fix the status quo. In their minds, nothing is actually broken. And although that is not me saying that, that the risk lies a defense for a write-off, it is me putting in a very sensational way that the business possibly uh, might not be acting in your interest as a material risk taker, but in acting in the interest of the business saving money. So my point is, how do you know this is getting done? So if we look at building a consumer credit journey, for example, um, we're, we're going to have the CONC applied to us, which is the consumer credit source book from the FCA. That's our local UK one. And so they're going to ask us to do a couple of things. So CONC 4.1.22 says that a quotation that includes must include the following text where a credit agreement is secured against the main place of residence. So you have to include this block of text. On CONC 11.1.9, this is the firms take adequate uh, must make adequate records uh, concerning the exercise of right to cancel and retain them for at least three years. There's an interesting bit of data there. And if we skip to this last one, the NOC, if you're dealing with consumer credit applications and you're pulling credit records from, from the bureaus, if somebody adds a notice for correction, which you're entitled to do in the 1974 Consumer Credit Act, or sorry, the 1974 yeah, Consumer Credit Act, you're entitled to add an, what's called a notice of correction. So this is your explanation as to why something has happened. If you were to add one of those to your credit record, nobody should be able to automatically decision on your data. So they can't, you can't apply for a credit card and have somebody automatically, the system say, yes, you're approved. A human must read that knock. And so your application must be acknowledged by a human. And very interestingly, if you were to add a knock after the fact, then that company would then need to, up to three months later, then go back and review their decision based on the data that you've then added. And these are interesting things. So those are small examples, and there are a massive number of source books with the FCA. How do you know that you're doing this? If you take something as simple as GDPR, how do you know that these many, many hundreds of people working for you have actually implemented the, the code for this stuff? How do you know? So the only way that we know is an audit. The only way to figure out that we've done this stuff is to get somebody to audit. Now we could look to our third line of defense to go and do that internal audit, but do they really have the technology capability to look at what we've done and say, absolutely, I'm sure that piece of code meets that. We've, we've we met that requirement and we're safe there. We don't. And so we end up going to the fourth line of defense. We end up going for an external audit where we bring these people in that have more technology knowledge, less understanding of the business. It causes a big ramp up time, costs a lot of money to go through these audits. And we that's where we seek our assurance. So we've started here and now we're all the way over here and we're miles away from software engineering. And, and there's, a, there's a reason for that. So if we retro this really quickly, as we move deeper into the lines of defense, our understanding of the business and the controls start to fade. Our knowledge of the systems that we're building starts to fade, and we end up with less business knowledge. So like I said, when we end up at a fourth line audit, we end up with a massive amount of ramp up time to understand the products that we're building, to understand how the business works. Technical depth fades, um, and that third line lacks the fundamental technology skills to engage. And often, I've actually seen this with second line as well. Second line also lack the technology um, experience and depth to be able to engage correctly with first line. We don't produce adequate evidence of our compliance. And a lot of this is around when we go and say we want a fourth line assurance audit, it's because we want to build a pack of evidence to say for each one of these controls, for all of this governance and legislation, show me the evidence that we're doing this stuff. Our first lines are not prepared to go and build that evidence. Um, and I, I've talked about this before, about the eroded line of first defense and, and a lack of first line of defense. It's all very well that management owned that, but when you look at what engineering's doing, you need engineers that are able to identify the risk and understand the control set so they know when to apply them. It's no good this stuff being run by management. And so if you're not teaching your engineers about the risks that you have established and about your control set, they're seldom likely to be able to go and apply that control set. And so you end up with almost no lines of defense there at the front. Um, and then we, 
we live in an increasingly global world. So regulation is happening all around us and it's global at this point. We don't just do business in our area. And I want to give this example of a Canadian company that was processing data um, from EU citizens. Now, this is really interesting. They got fined 525,000 euros for not having appointed a representative in the EU. Now, even though they're in a Canadian company, they're processing EU data, but it's just the case of them not having an appointed uh, a person. One rule in GDPR, and they get fined uh, half a million euros, which is, uh, you know, should really bring it home to us. Um, and then CRD4, uh, sorry, CRD5, which was introduced in December last year, has brought even more people under that umbrella of, of being material risk takers from a quantitative perspective. So history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And as we look at other industries, such as automotive and electric, who've had years of untrammeled innovation, we've seen that after a certain period of time, they start to get more robust and we start to see regulation. We start to see um, the industries under more and more scrutiny. And I think we're getting closer to the, to the dawn of compliance where we're gonna to start to see more of that with regulation in software, engineering and inside businesses, whether you're a small startup, whether you are an enterprise. What we're missing is the chain home, that chain of evidence, that way that we can go and relate source code back to the legislation, the reg reg regulation, the uh, standards, the controls, and those NFRs. H how do we build that chain, that link into code? Currently, there's no solution. But I bet you're really glad that you're not a bank. And I would say that compliance is now a feature and not an afterthought, and the world is changing. All software is regulated, so all comp companies need to solve for this. Now, I, I am working on something that's very close to, to solving this, and we will have something to announce very soon. It's not, not there yet, so do stay in touch. But it's just something to think about, that massive gap um, in software engineering where right now we can't relate any of those regulations and legislations and standards back to source code in its entirety, that's not standardized. Um, thanks for having me, and that's the end of my talk. Aubrey, thank you very much for that. I mean, a lot of information in that, but sobering hardly seems to cover it, to be honest. That's some pretty worrying stuff in there. Our next speaker, Martin Thorne, is head of data science at Standard Life Aberdeen. He wants to talk about why data science actually needs, requires leadership. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my basement in Glasgow. Um, hopefully you can all see and hear me clearly. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to take a wee bit of time to talk about data science and where I think it's going wrong. Um, but before I do that, I think if I'm going to be bold enough to say where I think it's going wrong, I think I also need to kind of say where, where I'm coming from and what, why I think that's the, what my experience has been. So first of all, it's clear, I just want to be clear, I'm not a data scientist, um, but I do have 25 years of making sense of data. Um, in various different uh, companies. So originally direct mail companies and then really sales focused companies. So number of different, uh, a number of different industries, travel, utilities, media, financial services. But what's all brought them together is the fact that um, they all very data centric companies that, that are very sales focused and need that data to tell them exactly what's going on. So I'm really, I'm here to ensure commercial output from data science, and that's what I've been doing over the last three years and running specifically data science teams and the prior years looking at other sort of data, data topics. Really what I would describe myself as business focused and IT trained. So just want to give you that context before I start throwing stones um, in case anyone wonders where I'm coming from. So first of all, why does it need leadership? Well, I've been in this role a year, um, but when I was looking to change jobs, I spoke to a number of different companies. And what consistently came out from the companies I've spoken, spoken to was this belief you weren't getting actionable output from data science. So there's a view that um, I spent sometimes hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of pounds building big data infrastructure, um, hiring data scientists, um, throwing them into a room and just going, we're just not getting the output. And that's backed up by an often quoted kind of Gartner uh, fact, which is they say that they believe between 80 and 85% of all data science projects fail, which sounds terrifying in and of itself. But worse than that, of those that do succeed, they believe that only 8% of them generate value. Now, you can quibble with the numbers, and some people have quibbled with the numbers and said it's maybe it should be 70%, it maybe it should be 80%, whatever. But the reality is that 
across the world, people are not reporting huge success from data science projects. And for me, it comes down to the kind of quite glib answer, which is we've sold the once in a lifetime Caribbean holiday. We've actually delivered Troon Beach in the rain and there's not even an ice cream van. And that's sometimes the only good thing about going to Troon Beach, a bit of a local joke, there you go. Um, so what, what do I think has gone wrong? And if you start to look at it, and in my experience, we've got the skilled data scientists, you know, we've got some incredibly clever data scientists. I've been fortunate enough to, to, to meet and work with a number of people who are absolute geniuses. That's not the issue, they're really well skilled. Thanks to things like um, Cloud Platform, AWS, um, Azure, Google, uh, Google BigQuery, we've got unlimited compute and storage. You know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when file names had to be eight characters long. You know, and I, I had more than one job where you were needing to do um, sort of work on the database prior to running your overnight batch because otherwise you wouldn't, you'd have to reclaim space, otherwise it wouldn't run. That's not the issue anymore. You've got unlimited compute and storage. We certainly don't struggle for use cases. You know, I've got a smartwatch on my wrist that's generating so much data. You've got all your, you know, all of the systems now are generating a multitude of data that we've never seen before. Past experience working retail banking, people used to pull out 50 quid. Now instead they're to two pound here, three pound there on, on their kind of phones and their um, contact list. So there's so much data coming through that we need to be able to make sense of. So use cases are there. There seems to be ample funding and interest from the board. I was hired during a global pandemic um, by a fairly conservative asset management company. They also allowed me to hire three additional data scientists. The role of chief data officer, that's not an unusual role anymore. People seem to be really comfortable with the fact that that, that is now exists and that is where we need to go. So if all those things aren't wrong, it must be something wrong with what we're doing or how we're doing it. And I think it comes down to a lack of appropriate leadership. And I believe that we're, we're prioritizing the technical skills over leadership skills. And I'm gonna give you a few, a few examples. So I looked at Director of Data Science roles that advertised on LinkedIn in May this year. And the key here is Director of Data Science. Now I know sometimes in different companies, different role titles mean different things, but wherever you work, Director is a reasonably serious title. So we look at the first one, Director of Data Science for a pharmaceuticals company. What were the must-have skills they were looking for? Masters or PhD in data, five to six years commercial experience working at transforming data ecosystems with R and Python. I couldn't get that. Director of Decision Science at a fintech bank. Not just any fintech bank, but my fintech bank, the bank that I have an emotional connection with. Surely they're going to be better. You, know, you need to have strong analytical skills backed up by technical coding skills. SQL and Python are desirable. So I've got SQL, don't have Python, can't work for them. Director of Data Science for a large media company, PhD in a quantitative field, other stuff we're looking for, experienced communicator. So it's a must have the other PhD. If you're a communicator, that'd be brilliant too, but really it's the PhD you care about. Director of Data Products and Data Science for a big online gaming company extensive experience in machine learning, mathematical, statistical, or other quantitative skills, and, de and demonstrates sound knowledge in a breadth of ML techniques. Again, I, I, I personally would struggle. I, I might not even get an interview for that role. So let's look at another example. This is what the board, this is in the job description. This is, this is what obviously the board signed off. As head of modeling and data science, you'll be able to report directly to the CTO and work alongside directors and senior staff. Main objective of the role is to effectively manage and grow the modeling team in order for the company to deliver more automated analytical products under tight deadlines. Fantastic. Suddenly, finally, somebody gets it. This job, to, this is going to be fantastic, isn't it? This is what they want. 17 different skills, and only one of them is non-technical. In there, they've actually asked for people to be an expert in Excel VBA. And these are the sorts of skills that this is for a direct, that's a head of modeling and data science role. And they're prioritizing VBA skills. Obviously, there's, there's PhD and MSc requirements in there as well, but the, the, the non-technical is uh, strong communication skills. There's only a passing mention to management. There's no mention of mentoring, and there's no mention of experience of running a big team in a commercial operation. Okay, so am I making a really big deal about nothing here? Maybe, just maybe, it's not actually a big deal. Maybe if you've got techies running a team, it, it'll work fine, and there's no issue, and I'm just bumping my gums about nothing. 
So what I did was I went online and I looked at kind of a number of different reference articles and different research that said, what makes up great leaders? If we look at people that we would identify as being great leaders, what sort of common traits do they have? Decisive, empathetic, charismatic, great communication skills, outgoing. None of that I don't think you would argue with. You can all relate to somebody probably in your past or, or your current role where you can say, yeah, they're a great leader and they, they exemplify at least a couple of those skills. Now, it's almost impossible to say, what does the typical data scientist look like? But if you start looking at in, uh, sort of psychometric profiling, so one of my favorites is insights. Insights categorizes people broadly into four different colors. And the one that generally goes to, to, to kind of people of a scientific bent or people of a kind of a quite technology bent is the cool blue energy. And if you look at what traits cool people who have an excess of cool blue energy have, they generally tend to be cautious, reserved, Oh, that's problem build there. And they tend to be cautious, reserved, uh, precise. Uh, oh, I don't know what's happening, but yeah, these these are the traits that they're exhibiting. They're exhibiting they're, they're exhibiting skills uh, and traits that are not the same as the ones you would have for great leaders. Now, of course, there are exceptions, and absolutely, you will be able to find people. Ali K. Miller of AWS. Um, You've got Cassie Kozikov of, of Google. Both are data scientists who are exceptional communicators, and I'm guessing exceptional leaders. But the example I would always give is, the, regardless of what sport you tend to follow, if you follow a particular sport, you'll, there'll be loads of examples where the best manager, when you look back on his or her past, they've maybe not been the best player, but they're a brilliant coach and they're a brilliant manager. And certainly my, my sport of choice is Formula One or even cycling. And in both those examples, you've got people like Dave Bilsford in cycling, you've got Toto Wolff of Mercedes AMG, you've got um, Christian Horner of Red Bull. Those three individuals were all fairly handy um, at a kind of amateur level but they were never going to reach the, the kind of high levels of the sport. They were never going to be the exceptional people who, who would be out there being world champions. But they're fantastic managers and fantastic coaches. And that's what I think we need to look at is that you might be really lucky and you might get the unicorn and the unicorn might be able to, to, to deliver both, but it's pretty rare. So why do we have this mismatch? Why in data science do we have this mismatch? And I believe it's because too many people believe the hype. Too many people were told, you don't need plans or process or governance. Just fire all data into a big data um, environment. Add data scientists, lock them in a room, and they will come back and they will answer the questions you didn't think to ask. But also, I think it's because the language of data science and machine learning is scary. You know, if it, I often joke that if you say the phrase machine learning algorithm, it strikes the same fear into people as that's not chocolate does into the appearance of toddlers. You know, it's just one of those things you, you, you're, you just, you're, your blood runs cold and you go, oh God, no, please. Um, I have toddlers, as you can probably guess. Um, I also think it's because data science isn't very mature as a, as a business concept. So because it's not very mature, and because people have believed the hype, they maybe believe that you need an expert, you need somebody who really, really understands it, which is true, but that doesn't necessarily mean you need a practitioner. But there is this belief that the only people that can understand it is people who've been through that data science journey. And my rather controversial opinion is that I think data scientists are too focused on the what we're doing and not the why. I sometimes think they, they, they enjoy the what we're doing more than the why, more than the output. And to my mind, a good data science leader would really help to focus a team. If you have a team that's led by data scientists, I think often you, you maybe lack that focus. I think one of the things that would be interesting that, 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 that this kind of external way of looking at things would mean that you'd, you'd end up having conversations that more technically interesting work doesn't always mean more commercially viable. We lost, some, we lost something in a past company where there was basically two elements to the machine learning that we built. One element was just a bit we'd taken off the internet that classified people's transactions into that's coffee, that's petrol, that's supermarket shopping. And the other bit was homegrown and it was all about predicting people's spend. And what we found when we, when we soft launched it internally was the bit that the customers, the internal customers really cared about was the categorization engine. They thought it was fantastic. We've never seen anything like this before. This is what they wanted. 
But for the data scientists that built it, that was a bit that really hurt because that, that wasn't theirs. They hadn't spent any time building that. They just robbed it off the internet. And they were deeply, deeply motivated to get people to be involved and excited about the bit of work that they were excited about. And that was the bit they built. But the reality was there wasn't really a commercial use case for it. It wasn't something that people wanted to do. Similarly, I think sometimes the universities are, are, are slightly guilty of this, is that we, by the time you've reached PhD level, you've done an awful lot of really incredibly clever stuff. You then come into the business world and you get to the stage where less complicated means easier buy-in, which means more successful rollout. If you're talking about some kind of black box where you just basically throw data in, churn the handle and it spits out an answer that says 52, if everyone then goes, well, why is it 52? Well, we don't know. The computer just says it's 52 and we have to trust it. It's a really difficult thing to get trust and get rollout in, across an organization. And similarly, the, the question is, well, do the data scientists know what makes the company money? And they might know at a high level, yeah, we make money by doing this, but how much do they really understand? And often data scientists are maybe a bit more junior, maybe a bit younger. We had real difficulty in a, in a past role um, because of the traits that we've seen earlier about cautious and, 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 and basically not, not necessarily risk takers, we really struggled getting data scientists to understand customers getting into debt because it wasn't a concept that they really got around. And they're trying to get to the stage where we were building processes to, to help customers who'd got themselves into debt was quite difficult with somebody who just couldn't conceive of why you wouldn't open a letter, you know, why you would get yourself into debt and not open the letter that's been sent to you. And it, I think that's where it becomes really interesting that you need that kind of sometimes that experience and that maybe, dare I say it, slightly broader outlook to help work out what, what, the, what the company want to do. The other issue is I've come across quite a lot is how good is good enough? Because of the precise nature of the, of, of, of the skill set, um, there's always a desire to kind of keep incrementing it, keep making it better and keep making it better and keep making it better. And you might spend three, three months working on something, taking it from 94% to effective to 95% effective. But it's maybe 94% was more than good enough. And maybe the investment to take it to the next stage was, wasn't required. And kind of linked into that, knowing when to cut your losses. One of the things I've implemented in my current role is that instead of having year-long projects, we're breaking them up into one-month kind of chunks. So we get to a stage where regardless of where we are, at the end of the month, we sit down and we say, okay, what have we achieved in the, in the last month? And can we honestly look ourselves in the mirror and say that it's worth another month and that things will be better, materially better in a month? And it's that kind of short-term focus that allows you to then start commercially saying, if you were paying for that person, if you were paying for your time out of your own pocket, would you be comfortable with the progress we've made in a month? And would you be comfortable enough to put money on the table and say, I'll fund you for another month? Now, often the funding model for data science means it doesn't really, that's not really how it works. My team, for example, are funded for the, for the year and we don't have short-term financial targets. But I think introducing those short-term targets really helps to kind of focus the mind. And then showing my marketing kind of background, but often data science struggles in terms of finding a unique selling point. So what does this algorithm, what, what have we built? What does it do? Well, it could do anything. It's unlimited possibilities. We could do all these things. But often what you need to do is find that one unique selling point and sell it really hard. The example I often give is James Dyson when he, when he first developed the, the Cyclone vacuum cleaner. Because there was no bag, he also realized that he, he made a dry cleaning powder and he realized that the, 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 you could dry clean your carpets and it wouldn't get clogged up. But he successfully realized that, that um, or he, he, he cleverly realized that going in selling the Cyclone vacuum cleaner by itself was a massive ask for people. If he then said, oh, by the way, you can dry clean your carpets, people would just go, no, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So he picked his one USP and sold it really, really hard, which is it's Cyclone, there's no bags. Okay, so coming towards the end, what do I think a good data science leader looks like? Well, I think they're able to demystify and lower the bar to entry. And Cassie and Ali that I talked about earlier, if you find either any of them, um, Ali does a lot of stuff on Instagram, for example, about machine learning, which isn't the natural place you would expect 
machine learning kind of tutorials to be, but she does Instagram lives on, in, on machine learning and how to get into it. And it's, it's always pitched at a really nice level. And I think that's the one of the key things, you just being able to explain it to my 73 year old mum and being able to talk in terms that my mum finds comfortable. That's the key for me. Not being afraid to say no when it's not the right fit. When, you know, being able to play the long game and being able to iterate to a great solution. Often when work comes to me in my current role, somebody says, I want to do some data science. And you sit down with them and you talk to them and you find, you know, you're miles away from data science just now, but I can still help you. Let's build something, let's centralize your data, let's put a, let's put a dashboard across it and let's see what we can do to help you. That's a, it's a long game to build trust and, and to, to iterate your way to a great solution. I think you'd be focused on return on investment. I'm probably overly paranoid about, especially in, in the current climate, what have I done to justify my salary today? What have my team done to justify their salaries? How are we pushing the business on? What are we doing? And I think if you have that element of paranoia, it helps really focus on, are we doing things that are intellectually interesting or are we doing things that are commercially viable? I think the key point is a good data science leader does something that their team can't. And that's often where the data scientists running the data science team come struggles. Now, I've had data scientists working for me who really struggled because they wanted to work for a PhD who they could learn from because they didn't believe they could learn from me. And that's where I think it's really important to start looking at separating the roles. When you're building a great team, you need complementary skills, but you also need people who are at opposite ends of the spectrum to help provide that balance. And that's where I think the great leader needs to be. The great leader needs to be somebody who can offer that balance and who isn't the same as the rest of their team. And ultimately, you're looking for someone who can empower, inspire, and motivate. Now, it's no secret. You can take data science out of it. A lot of those things that I've talked about are kind of great leaders in technology. And if you change some of the language in there, it's generally just great leaders. And that's where I think my, my head's at, is that data science isn't that special. I mean, it's pretty cool, and I really enjoy working on it, and I'm delighted that, it, that, that we're making such advances and that people are really interested in it. But it doesn't mean you rip up the rule book and start again. You still need those core leadership skills. So to, to bring it to con some conclusion and to offer some advice, when I've been throwing stones, can I offer some advice as well? Machine learning is incredible, but it's not magic. It's not going to magically fix all of your problems. And if you start pitching it that way, you're going to get yourself into trouble really quickly. One of my favorite phrases, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So it's very tempting sometimes that everything, the answer to everything is machine learning. It's only one tool in your toolbox. And a lot of the times, the more basic data stuff, verity in the most basic leadership stuff can, can really often add more value. The best recipes come from using the best ingredients, not using the best oven. And it's a bit trite, but that you so the best recipes, the best solutions that you can build have got great data. They're maybe not the best algorithm. It's about the great data and making sure that the environment for success is perfect. And to my mind, new technology and techniques is where you need leadership the most. That's when you need someone to steer the ship. That's when you need a steady hand to say, no, we're not going to go down that way. We're going to go this way. Yeah, that's interesting, but let's park that for the moment. That's where you need that most, most amount of skill. And to me, strong leaders simplify hard concepts. And that's something that, that in, my, in my experience, they say it's something that's hard for, for a data scientist to do. And like I say, you have the unicorns that can do both. But what I think you need is somebody really strong who can just sit down and say, this is how it works. This is what you need to worry about. This is what you don't need to worry about. And that's me. Thanks very much for listening. Martin, thank you very much for that. Uh, a tremendous amount of good sense contained within that. It's been many, many years since I was the father of toddlers, but that phrase of his is now going to haunt me for days, possibly forever. A third speaker in this third session is Hugh Bruce Garden, Head of Business Intelligence at TD Squared. Great title of a talk, In God We Trust, Everybody Else Has to Bring Data. Hugh. Thank you very much. So um, I'm actually returning to a theme that, um, that I used 
when I spoke at uh, at a digit conference back in in 2018 in the middle of the the beast of the east. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about this is actually it's a quote from a chap called William Edwards Denning. And he's a man off my own heart. He trained as an electrical engineer, but then moved into st to statistics. So that's kind of my, my background. But I, I'm going to soften this a little. I've said all others must bring data. I, I, what I'd hope, actually, is that I, I can try and convince you that, that all others really should bring data. And that's, that's kind of really where we want to be. But the key theme here is this interplay between data and trust. And Martin, I think, did a really great job in, 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 in his talk about talking about some of the kind of simplicity um, in, uh, in, in data science and actually getting that message across. And that's really kind of a part of where I want to go here. Um, and it's really how these things feed into how leaders can use data in terms of how they speak to an organization, um, both internally and, and externally. And the, the kind of theme here is that in order to get sort of resilience and adaptability, which is really what, what has been so critical through this, this, uh, this, this period of the, of the pandemic, that also requires a very strong and distributed ability to detect and correct errors as they appear. So essentially, as things change, and gosh, they've been changing very, very fast. You need the power within the organization to be able to see those, to understand where the organization is going, and so that those decisions can be distributed and made at the lowest level, and that, and that everyone within the team feels empowered to do that. Now, in order to do that, you really need to be able to delegate, and, and you need to really good, strong, sustainable leadership in order to, for delegation, that requires openness, honesty, and transparency, and that really requires data. Now, I'm, I'm kind of hammering this, this idea a, a, a little bit, but before I do that, I want to just give you a few examples of how potentially this might go wrong um, and, and what might happen if, if you don't share that data. Um, and, and probably the, the, the biggest and worst example of that is this. That's the Rect Reactor number four at Chernobyl. The designers of the RBMK knew that it had a positive void coefficient. That is, if it got too hot and the coolant started to boil off, the reaction would increase, it would get hotter, and the position would get worse. It had a fundamental instability in it. But the designers did not have the trust in the organization to be able to share that information. And it was, and it was the lack of that knowledge that allowed this accident to happen. It could have been prevented, and it should have been prevented, but it was that failure to trust, to share that data, that meant that the critical instructions were not available or were not followed by the people re operating that reactor. So when I say that they didn't share that data, probably actually what I really mean is just the trust wasn't there. And, and, and where you have that lack, that's where you're storing up problems. But let me give you another example, a slightly more recent example, but it's a really good example of, of how a really simple data message can be important. And it's to do with the blood clot scare for the COVID vaccines. Now, it hit AstraZeneca the hardest, but in fact, pretty much all the vaccines have at least some uh, element of blood clots associated with them. But my real concern here is how this data was presented and the failure to actually put it in context. And in particular, if you look at that final one, these headlines are all from, from mid-March when this, um, when this uh, blew up. And the Telegraph one there, AstraZeneca chief must do more to defend the vaccine. Well, I think this is actually a failing of the media that actually they could have presented the data in a way that the scare would have died down. That Reuters quote, European trust in AstraZeneca COVID vaccine plunges, poll shows. Well, that's just replaying the media story. And even our dear old health secretary really failed to do a good job on this. So let's see, look at what he said. This is what the, the, the clip that he put out on BBC News as reported by BBC, BBC News on March 16th. The AstraZeneca vaccine is safe. 
We know that 10 million people have had it. That's what the regulator says, the WHO and the European regulator. We keep the effects of these vaccines under review all the time. And we know that the AZ vaccine is saving lives in the UK. If you didn't already trust him, that would do nothing to improve your view of the vaccine. So what I'd like to do is present an alternative of actually just showing the data and trusting that people will get it. And it looks like this. So let's say we take a million people and we give them the vaccine. We'd expect to see potentially for maybe as many as 10 blood clots. The question is, is that a big number? Is that a number we should be afraid of? And how do we put that in context? The first thing is, well, what might we expect? In TV Squared, this is probably the biggest single thing we have to do, is understand what would happen in the absence of any TV advertising um, or, or other uh, um, uh, display advertising happening. What would you expect to see? Because you've got to strip that out first to see what the lift is, what the, what the delta is. And in fact, for um, cerebral venous thromboses, somewhere between two and 15, it's a difficult signal to detect. So against the background, the question is, are we seeing a huge amount more? Mm -hmm, possibly. But let's ex accept that there is something there and that, that, this, that, that any problem of this sort is a tragedy and we should try to avoid it. The question is, even then, does this risk look realistic? Is this something that we would expect to see? Do we normally deal with risks of this sort? So let's look at other examples, oral contraceptives, for example. Classic case here is that for AZ, they're looking at, um, at moving on to different vaccines for the younger population where the, where the actual COVID risk is lower. These are the people who are more likely to be taking oral contraceptives. For a million people, you'd expect to see 100 blood clots a year. So we're looking at anything between 10 and 25 times the risk is something that people completely routinely accept. It's not a problem. So there's this gap here of understanding a scary number of the worst and blood clots versus is this really an issue? So let's take another example here. House fires in England and Wales. Take a million people. House fires will affect 500 people per year out of per million. In Scotland, it's almost double that. And the difference between those two is in fact almost entirely deep fat fryers. So there's, a, there's a, a, an obvious thing you could do to reduce your risk, which is one of the things that you want to do with data is how do I act on this stuff? In Scotland, the answer would be, and Aubrey, I'm afraid, mentioned it, the deep fried Mars bar. Um, we've got to lose the deep fried Mars bars. But that still leaves you with you 500 per million. And if we want to deal with that, what do you have to do? Well, the primary risk there is actually electrical fires. So if you wanted to reduce that, that number, potentially you're looking at removing electricity. But that's an example where what you do to try and reduce the risk actually makes it worse. You take electricity out, people go back to naked flames, and your 500 doesn't drop, it goes back to something similar to 900. And that puts this in context. If you don't have the vaccines, you end up looking at not removing the four blood clots, you end up with COVID deaths. And that's the number, that's the trade-off that really should be presented. And it feels to me as though that's an example where a really the data is incredibly simple, and that's a message that can be put out, and you don't then get the flare-up vaccine hesitancy. And having trust that you can put those numbers in front of the population and in front of people, people will make the right decisions. That's easier to do inside uh, an organization that you control, and it's something that I would very strongly recommend you do. There is one other alternative way that you can get this wrong, uh, and that is where you do share the data, but what you're doing is not trustworthy. Um, and it seems every time I present it, Digit, um, Facebook does something awful. Um, this is an example, and they did get taken down for this, where an organization put some very, very closely targeted adverts together and then showed in the creative why a particular individual uh, had been served an advert. Um, how they managed to find GPs with a master's in art history, 
Um, I do not know, but they did. Um, uh, that's an example, but uh, I'm confident that in terms of this audience, that's not going to be a problem. But that takes me back to this of, well, what do you do and how do you do and, and, and how do you make data work for you? And particularly in the case of the pandemic um, and, and where there have been some tough decisions where the data is not looking good. And the exemplar here from a leadership perspective is this chap here. This is Rear Admiral James Stockdale, who was a US Navy pilot who was shot down during the Vietnam War and taken prisoner. And he said, you should read his story. It's worth, it's, it's, it's worth looking at. He was very, very, very badly treated whilst in captivity. And in fact, the degree that you can see around his neck, a Congressional Medal of Honor. But he got through it, and it was a, a, an absolutely exemplary uh, um, instance of, of leadership. But he came up with this, uh, this stock phrase, which is, is known now as the Stockdale Paradox, that looks a little bit like this. You must never confuse the faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. It's the realists who will win through. Optimists, when given bad information all the time or, or, or given bad news successively, will struggle. Pessimists struggle to get off the ground. It's the realists who will win through. And that's very much what we've needed to do through the pandemic, is to be open, to be clear about what is going wrong and, and, and what the implications of that are, but show that that is the meat that you that you have a plan to get through it to demonstrate what you can do to counter the position you're in so from our perspective that's one of the things that i was doing right from the word go at um as soon as the lockdown um was imposed in march last year was we started to look because we can see this data in real time and to try to summarize to see well what's happening to our customers so that we could start to talk to them. So the examples here, these charts are all based on uh, the industry averages that we can see from our client base of the changes in their web traffic, essentially the, the volumes of consumers that they're seeing um, indexed against their average through, through January and February. So we're seeing some terrifying de um, uh, declines in, in, in traffic levels. But because we were able to see this, we were then able to go and actually talk to those. We were forearmed to be able to go and talk to our clients and say, right, how do we manage through this? Um, in many cases, that meant they would be dispensing with our services. But there's no point trying to flog the dead horse. You've got to be realistic about what you're trying to do and, and, uh, and what the, the art of the possible is. And that, for, for us, was a really key way to start to build trust, uh, to, to, to build that trust with, those, with, with our customers. It's, it's a way of actually showing that we understand where they're coming from. It's going to impact us as well, but there's no point trying to fight the reality uh, of, of what you're dealing with. And for some industries, that remains true. Travel is still extremely badly affected, and we'd be interesting to see how this does pick up. I'm checking this on an on a almost daily basis now. The flip side of that is that we did have some winners as well, um, and we're seeing fairly major changes. Um, Oddly enough, health and fitness, online education, you can, you can expect to see as, uh, as huge growths. But these people were also having, these sorts of, uh, of clients were also having massive problems because everything that they thought they knew about their markets and where they were looking for, uh, for viewers and how to advertise was all over the show. You were seeing um, with, with furlough, you were seeing audiences massively increase during the daytime very little else to do. So they were having to completely change their, their buy pattern. And we were able to go and actually use our data to go and, and, and find our way through these to, um, uh, to, to help them make their decisions about what to do next. Internally, um, we were also very, very keen to try and make sure that we brought the whole company with us. So we used to do quarterly company updates um, fairly large scale quarterly reviews and um, and smaller reviews on a monthly basis. Those went to weekly. We got the entire company onto a Zoom call, 30 minutes, 
um, on a, a Friday afternoon, 3 p.m. on Friday, so that we could get West Coast US guys on as well. And that way of actually being able to show this is what's going on, this is where our clients are, this is where cash collection is, it helped everybody to understand where we were and what the position of the company was. It helps to settle and to make sure that everyone has a chance to talk to everyone, that, that everyone has a chance to see each other as we as we went remote. We took very frequent surveys. I think there've been discussions, there's a lot of discussion this morning about the impact of, uh, of, remote, walk, uh, of remote working um, on people's working conditions and on their team outlook. We took a lot of time to try and understand what were people's individual working environments and what could be done to improve it. Uh, I'm, you can see I'm actually at a, a standing desk here, um, which has made a huge difference um, at, for, uh, for my mental health. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way. It keeps you moving during the day. What we found, however, again, within the data was that there were very, very different um, views on, uh, on the impact of remote working. Some of our engineers were able to concentrate very much better, very, very um, uh, many fewer distractions, but some of the team leads were really struggling with it because all the social cues were missing, all the stuff about longer working days and so forth we, um, were, um, uh, we were beginning to find as well. But we were actually surveying and, and making sure that we were um, actually getting the correct view across the entire organization to be able to do that. Finally, with the dislocation of going um, of going remote, where you don't have the the natural serendipitous conversations around the water cooler and so forth, problems arise for all sorts of different reasons. Problems arise. The critical thing is, after you fixed the problem and the firefighting has died back, is to make sure that you can dig into that problem and that you can find what caused it to do. Uh, and, and to dig up the data to say, right, is there a way that we could have detected that? Because clearly where a problem occur, uh, occurs, to a very large degree, it usually it's an indicator that you have got a process problem that something is lacking. And the question is, can you catch it? So we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that we could close that loop. Wherever you see a problem, problems do occur. You don't go for the blame culture. You actually dig into it, find out how to prevent it, and, and find out whether or not there are early warning signals. And that's really one of the key things that we've been looking for in our data is to be able to see, could we find that? Because if you can, you can alert on it and we can start to build that loop. And that's really um, kind of my key tips for, um, uh, for, for, for how you use those data, data uh, to, to engender good leadership throughout the organization. Critical key takeaways. You have to have that openness. It's it's the only thing you've really got for uh, to to enable course correction. By having that openness, it requires you, but it is worthwhile to have faith in your colleagues and in your customers. But finally, and I hope I've done this, show, don't tell. Thank you very much. Hugh, thank you very much for that. Um, three very different presentations there, but I was trying to think of a thread that ran through all three of them, and I, I could be wrong on this, but I would suspect it's probably this, that one of the problems we face, and it's almost universal, is we're all talking different languages. So if we can bring um, Aubrey and Hugh and Martin back up, what might be the solution to that? I mean, Aubrey, it's, you know, you know, if I'm not speaking the same language as you, you're trying to explain something very complex to me, at what stage do we need to start educating people to, to talk in a universal tongue? Well, well, I mean, I would say that, that one of the inherent problems is that we don't have a lateral language that moves through enterprise organizations. So the folks down in engineering that are building software are not speaking the same language as second-line risk, maybe. And those folks in third-line risk are definitely speaking you know, a different language entirely. And so we have no common thread that runs through the organization. And a lot of what I'm focusing on is without that common thread, without that engagement, without that way to traverse the organization up to your material risk takers or um, your, your, your um, SMS, what does that look like? How do, we, how do we create instrumentation that will build that thread through the organization? Um, it's, 
you know, it doesn't exist at the moment, bluntly. And we we have, you know, if you talk to any anybody in a large organization, a bank, finance, you talk about this first lines of risk defense, you can pick those engineers and ask them to explain to you what legislation looks like, what regulation looks like, what those standards looks like. And beyond the technical stuff, they're not going to be able to explain to you how they implement that. They're not going to be able to show you the instrumentation. And so what we need to do is shift left. We need to look at instrumenting source code, instrumenting it with this is why this code exists. It's meeting this legislation. It's starting to meet this regulation and, and, and start looking at deeper meta uh, data that we can go and embed in that code to start building that picture and building that language. And then it doesn't matter. Then you don't need to worry about whether you can jump to a conversation with audit or whether you can talk to second line because you've got a bridge that's been built for you where you can come in at any level, whether you're a material risk taker and you're looking for assurance or whether you're somebody looking for an audit, an audit person could go and pull up all the evidence and see that straight away and start looking at what code is meeting which pieces of legislation and regulation. For a material risk taker, you're looking for assurance. And most of the time, this is, this is the big deal. What we can't provide is continuous assurance. You can't ever get a position of the thing that you're building, the thing that's happening underneath you as a material risk taker without an audit. Fundamentally, there's no way to solve that. The only way for you to understand whether you've met your obligations is to go to somebody else and say, I don't have the technical skills in-house. I need you to check the homework. Here is two million, three million. Martin, thoughts? I think it's the role of the translator becomes important. And I think as you start to commoditize a lot of technology, you start to outsource a lot of technology. In my particular sphere, you've now got tools that are allowing citizen data scientists. So things that five years ago would need coding skills, you can now just click on a graphical interface and do it. So I think as that happens, what you need is you need someone who can translate. Um, it's quite a difficult skill to, 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 to have, and it's quite a, a difficult skill to justify paying for. But I think once you've got it, it's the sort of thing that can really, really help bridge the gap because trying to get everyone up to speaking the same language, I think is a laudable aim, but I think is really hard. I think often in my business, you've got somebody talking here and someone talking there, but you've got someone in the middle who can kind of say, I think what they mean is, and kind of talk both languages. I think that's a really key kind of skill and a key, if I'm looking for to hire, it's a key trait I look for in new hires is can, can they do that? Or can, can do I think they can be taught that? Because that's a, that's a huge skill, I think, for the future for me. Do you think there's enough people out there who could possibly act as translators, Hugh? I don't know who they'd be. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different view on this, Mark. So um, part of it is translation. Well, I absolutely agree with what Aubrey Martin said there. But there's one other kind of top-down leadership bit here, um, and, and it goes back to that, that aphorism that, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. But if you've got your the part of the translation that we need is about a common language of what the values of the company are and to be able to have that that error correction for if someone if, if somebody at a lower level of the organization thinks something is going wrong to be able to just have that feel this doesn't feel like it's in in line with our values and to be able to escalate that that's a that's a cultural thing that leaders need to make and make absolutely clear, can is is allowed to happen. There is almost just what you were talking about, Martin. There's almost an inherent bias in the, you know when you read out the various job descriptions. You know, a lot of the time when people are uh, looking for applicants, they're really trying to employ themselves. So you know, they'll, they'll have gone to human resources and said, um, right, we we got a vacancy for such and such. Oh, what skills do they need? Bam, 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 bam. They go down the list. But, you know, they're, they're not thinking about the skills they don't have. Yeah, and I think, I think that's really important, especially when you start to, when, you, when you're starting to build out that team, is it's really, I mean, my company at the moment is full, of, is, is full of incredibly smart people, PhDs, you know, in front office and back office. But we, to your point, we, do, we don't have translators because we're, we're always reinforcing our existing biases by just hiring more people that look like us. And that's a thing, that's a huge problem. It's something I'm always wary of is that if I'm looking for somebody, I look for communication skills first. 
but I'm always trying to sense check myself to say, well, maybe I shouldn't put, for this particular role, do we need to be a great communicator? Sometimes they don't. You know, and that's sometimes where I have to take a step back and go, I'd hire a communicator, but really maybe what we need for this particular role is somebody who is comfortable working on their own and maybe is a bit more withdrawn and, and, and maybe it isn't quite as good because it's not required. So I think it's something that we all struggle with, but I think in, in particular in technology, I think we end up, you, you are qualified to this level, therefore everybody working for me has to be qualified to that level and, and no arguments. Yeah, I'm, trying, I'm trying to imagine a set of circumstances where being a good communicator could be a handicap, Aubrey. Um, being a good communicator can be a handicap. I don't, I don't think, I mean, I, I guess in technical teams that there are those at times when maybe being a good communicator could be misconstrued as not being technical enough or not being... Um, close enough to the metal, and I think I've seen that happen before. Um, I guess it depends on where you want to position yourself. I mean, certainly for myself, um, my ability to communicate, my ability to tell stories, my ability to to make something relatable um, is something that has been intrinsic to to my kind of leadership and and being able to to understand um, what what my leadership looks like. Um, I don't think it's ever something that, that, that is bad, but yeah, like, like I said, certainly in, in technical circles, there could be a moment where the over communicator is, is seen as maybe the least technical of the group and, and, and could be the, you know, the least respected. But I hope that we're moving away from those sort of times. How do you actually assess your leadership skills? I mean, what mirror can you stand in front of? Well, I mean, it's, it's, your, it's your team, isn't it? It's the team, it's the people around you, it's the organisation that you work for, your, your tenure. Um, you know, you, as a good leader, you should be constantly seeking feedback that, you know, you are moving in the right direction, that you are asking the right questions, that you, that you are, you know, your, your team ultimately is going to talk to folks outside your, your, your area of influence and they're going to talk about you and they're going to talk about what you're doing. And I think that's going um, gonna to be the ultimate measure, right, when you hear that feedback. Yeah. Well, again, come back to this business, Hugh, what, what, what role... I'm just conscious of the fact we seem to have been talking about this for a decade and it's not getting any better. In fact, if anything, it's possibly getting worse. So, you know, how, how do you how do you break it? How do you break the cycle? Um, uh, the, 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 the cycle of, of uh, just to be clear, t technology not speaking to the business and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's there's an element that says, and to go back to Martin's point or, or, or that that earlier question, is it um, is it a, is there ever a downside to being a good communicator? Not necessarily. It's more uh, it's more that it may not be vital in certain roles, but the higher up you you go up the tree, the more important it becomes, which is really the the, the main theme of, of of Martin's Martin's presentation, which is so uh, I think very well put together. Um, there is always going to be, um, if you like, a spectrum of of harder skills at one end, softer skills at the other, and the and tech is necessarily hard. Um, if you are, and and I'm, I'm, I've got one guy immediately at mind who whose job it is to make sure that our databases don't fall over. And he's dealing with you know trillions of records a day. That is a different skill set to getting customers on board, and and uh, you know and keeping investors happy. Um, those are those are different things. And there is actually a data science role which is often called the bridge, which is that person who spans between them that has some of the tech skills but also speaks the business language. That's that's the role that I originally did for TV Squared when we when we first set up, um, and. I, I'd say it's not a question of trying to solve that. I think that may be the wrong approach. I think that the point is to to learn to live with it and to make sure that you recognize it's there and and try and prevent it being a problem, I think is the is is the issue. It's understanding that it is going to be there. It's never going away. So let's work through it make sure that the bridges exist. That's really, I think, the, the key to that. Okay, let me play devil's advocate then. Um, and this is a general question to all three of you. Choose whoever wants to answer first. Um, why is this different from, you know, the vast majority of people out there drive, 
vast majority of people out there have got no understanding of the, the workings of the internal combustion engine, or worse still nowadays, electronic control units or anything else. Other, the tens of thousands of gizmos contained in a modern car. Why do I need to know this stuff? I'll, I'll bite. You don't have lots of people flying helicopters. What we're talking about and what Martin's been talking about, what Aubrey's talking about, is not at the level of, of, uh, of a car. It's the level of flying a helicopter. Now, what happens is that over time, it does get simpler. You, we don't have to... I remember putting a... Um, the first time I got um, ADSL broadband in, you had to configure the settings for PPPoE. You don't have to do that anymore. And that's what happens, is that as tech matures, it becomes more like driving a car. What we're dealing with here is at the helicopter end of it. That's my... I might have... I'm... I'm I think it's trust as well. I think that people, it's it's what what's what what happens if it goes wrong. I mean, if, if your ABS control unit goes wrong in your car, it's got bad consequences. But if the engine management system goes bad, it doesn't really mean you might break down. That's that. If you're the CEO of a company and you're investing five million pounds in the latest CRM platform and it goes wrong, ooh, that's a that's a big deal. And I think what what has probably changed is that. There's a view that, that technology has become, this has kind of been a democratization of technology. And as the, a lot of the cloud platforms have come out, it means that it's drifted up to board level where people are actually having a conversation that says, do we go with Google? Do we go with AWS? Do we go with Azure? Whereas 20 years ago, nobody really cared what particular on version of the on-prem database you were running. I, I think Part of it, I think it's just a big trust thing because partly the numbers are so massive and also because there is a view that if you are at a high level of an organization, you need to understand the technology. But what when I talk about simplifying it, one of the big things I'm battling at the moment is to stop. We are, we're currently on Azure. I want people to stop talking about Azure in my, in my organization because they shouldn't. the, the end users shouldn't care because we might swap it out for something else. And it's all about saying you have a cloud technology. You don't need to worry what the cloud technology is. That's what I get paid for. Uh, but that's quite even that statement in itself comes across as quite arrogant because it's like, of course I need to care, Sonny. I'm paying your wages, kind of a thing. And that that's where I think the challenge comes is it is trust. And I think that the technology isn't yet at a level where people are comfortable with it. So certainly when we look in financial services, we we've seen historical evidence of, of what significant risk and impact looks like. And if you ever look at that classic risk chart, um, there's a there's a high risk, low probability and low probability to high risk. And something like the pandemic is low probability, but, but high impact only has to happen once. And that's the problem with that risk chart is that anything that only has to happen once causes massive, massive impact. And if we look at the financial crises that we've seen and we've, we've walked through, we've seen what kind of impact that has on the market, what kind of impact that has on the global economy. When we see the, we look at the subprime mortgage um, um, thing that happened with low regulation there, that, that was a really good example of like whole banks failed because of that. And we see things like the capital requirements directive as a response to maintaining adequate liqui liquidity um, and adequate capital reserves to be able to, to deal with that. And then at lower levels in the UK, we think, see things like the PRA, who are there. The, the PRA is a really great institution. Um, I like to think of it like, a, like when something fails, they're designed to create a very orderly failure in the marketplace <laughs> so that our, 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 our marketplace can absorb um, a failure of a bank in a very orderly and British way. Um, and carry on functioning. And, that, and that's what they model around, looking at, you know, the PRA will engage with every firm on an individual basis and look at the kind of things that they might afflict them and model for those scenarios and figure out what those capital reserves should look like. Um, and, and, and so, you know, huge example of a helicopter, fantastic. You know, when you're dealing with, with these big banks, you know, it's not like uh, driving a car. Things can and do go wrong. And, and the impact that they can have is, you know, sometimes... We don't want to say immeasurable, but it's always measurable. You can always measure the financial damage that something's done. Um, and, and so ultimately, we have to create a, an environment of accountability and responsibility. And a lot of the stuff that I talked about today was around how you do that in financial services. But that is probably one of the more mature regulated um, environments. And when you look at other environments, the regulation is increasing and it's becoming more global um, and it's starting to afflict more people. Yeah, it's probably the film that Sid James and Barbara Windsor didn't get around to making carry on functioning. <laughs> but, um, 
you know, again, I'm, I'm wondering if we are crediting senior management with too much because um, the vast you take something like security I would say the vast majority of people aren't that bothered about security I came across a lovely quote just the other day from Bob Dylan saying you know you can sell your privacy but you can't buy it back most people nowadays have sold their privacy and will never ever be able to buy it back they're not particularly bothered about it they want a quick response etc why should management be be thinking in any different terms uh, security is it's reputational risk isn't it that is material risk and it's reputational risk for the firm. And reputational risk is the hardest thing for you to recover from. Once you've damaged that reputation, it's very, very hard to come back from that. It's also a really interesting vector because you're completely out of control. Like that you have zero control over security. That That is something that happens outside your sphere, sphere of influence. Say for example, you adopted something like a Kubernetes platform. The amount of daily CVEs that we see on Kubernetes, it just makes you want to not adopt that as a technology right now and look for somebody else to go and do that. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of these technologies that w that we adopt that become out of our control. And then suddenly you start asking yourself, you know, is this something that I want to be involved in? Or is this something that I want to commoditize? And I want somebody else to do for me. Um, and this is an interesting choice as a CTO that you make quite often. You look at you know, whether you have the skills in-house to run these technologies, what the benefits are, how far away it takes you from, from thinking about customer value and delivering to the customer. Um, everybody should care about security because it's very hard to come back from security breaches. You know, if you look at the Equifax breach, I mean, that was something that we're all never going to forget, right? And it's all going to stay in our minds. And whenever we start thinking about those credit bureaus, we'll start thinking about how safe is our data and it impacts every other credit bureau. You know, um, very hard to come back from. Um, Mark, I, I can take a, throw that back at you. If it's not the board of directors and the senior management worrying about it, who, who should be? Well, I, I'm not saying they shouldn't be worrying about it. I'm just wondering what quality, basically, it, why, why would their sensitivity to it necessarily be greater than Joe Public's unless it's going to personally impact it? Yes, I mean, I take Aubrey's point about reputational damage, but unless it's going to personally impact on them, uh, the reputational damage. I, I was the, I, as soon as Aubrey said that was exactly what I was going to say was reputational damage. That is that's entirely what it is, and it can it, it it can crater your business, and that that is the yeah. It's very 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 hard to come back from, and and it but, does impact you personally though, Mark. I mean, I, I think maybe like if you are a material risk taker, or you mm -hmm. are in that chain. Like the firm has absolute ability to come back and say, I'm going to take all that money that you've got vesting over the next couple of years, I'm going to take that back because you've done a bad job. It does significantly impact the people that are in positions of responsibility where they are accountable and they are material risk takers. If they're a position of senior, of significant harm functions or an owner or a senior management function, all of those people subject to malice and clawback and deferment of their bonus over n number of years. So it, so it is massive personal damage to them as well. Martin, do you accept the fact, as I said earlier, that we could, probably could have been having this conversation five or ten years ago? I think so, but I think what's happened is that the, the, the bar to entry has got higher, so we are now in a much more technically complex environment. So I think people have got better, but I think what's happened is the technology's got, if not more complicated, certainly more diverse. So you've now you're now dealing with problems that you never anticipated in the past. Uh, you're now having to think about the, the security example that, that, that um, Aubrey and Hugh, Hugh just talked about. We didn't really need to worry as much about being hacked 10, 15 years ago. We, obviously, you did, but not to the same extent. You've not got Internet of Things. You've not got, you know, these, these are things that you never needed to worry about that now suddenly the board of directors need to care about. And certainly in, in my organisation, Paradoxically, we're more worried about other people being better, so be, being quite parochial. We're worried about more other people, other companies being better at data science than us and making a massive jump ahead in terms of in terms of profitability and gun. And that's, I think, what's happened is that people, the worries of, the worries that we would have been talking about 10, 15 years ago, have been replaced by new ones. And as we get better and as we get more advanced, there's just other things that come in. So on the basis of past experience with technology, technology basically grows exponentially. It gets more and more sophisticated in time. We are going to be having exactly the same argument in 10 years' time, except it will be worse. I, I think there was something I read that said one of the key skills in the next sort of 10 to 15 years that we need to teach our kids 
is the ability to, to be able to filter what's important and what isn't important because they're getting deluged with so much information. And that always strikes me as that's something that I think is really important in the business world as well, that, that being able to ascertain, right, is that something I need to worry about or can I, can I give that to somebody else and can I, can I do it? But I think that the problem that you're describing isn't one that's specific to technology. I think it's 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 one that's specific to are big companies comfortable with with actually handing down responsibility and just saying, right, you're completely accountable for that, so I'm not going to worry about it. Most of the companies I've worked for aren't brilliant at that, and the really senior people are still coming down one, two, three levels deeper than they should, rather than just giving out the responsibility and, and letting those people be accountable. I think that's a, that's a challenge. And, and that, But yeah, I think we will be talking about very similar things in 10, 15 years, unless you're one of the companies that's managed to nail it, I think there's massive opportunity. But it's not easy because how do you how do you, do you how do you square that circle? Do you just hire a big load of communicators that sit in the middle? It doesn't feel like the right answer to me. <laughs> that has been fascinating. Martin, Hugh and Aubrey, thank you all very much for your time and thank you for your presentations this afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It's been fun. In fact, I'd just like to say thank you to all our speakers and sponsors today. And to remind you, the exhibition zone will remain open for another hour until half past four. Uh, there's still a chance to enter some of those competitions and win those prizes. If you could, and we'd really appreciate this, take a couple of minutes just to fill out the uh, conference survey and give us your feedback. There's a chance to win one of two £50 Amazon vouchers. Just open your briefcase right now to find the survey. That's the virtual briefcase, not the real briefcase. That's probably quite pointless. Uh, our next digit event uh, is Cloud First Summit. That's on Wednesday, the 23rd of June, uh, where we'll look at the maximising the benefits of cloud computing. Uh, there has obviously been a massive shift to cloud services over recent years, and it's going to look at how we navigate the challenges, control costs, uh, and manage increasingly complex environments in the cloud. You can secure a place by visiting the Digit booth in the exhibition hall. I hope you found today useful um, and informative. I said, please, if you can, take the time, fill in the conference survey, whether it's positive or negative, we'd be very happy to get your comments. Just anything that will potentially lead us to produce a better product in future, you'd be doing us a favour. From myself, Mark Stephen, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I wish you a good afternoon.